There are some excellent cassettes and books on this subject for you to investigate as well. Do all you can to stay fit, to stay healthy, and to stay well, because physical health and fitness affect how you feel about yourself and how you perform in the marketplace. When you feel good about yourself, other people will feel good about you too. Appearance, vigor, vitality, and well-being have a lot to do with how your life works out. That's the physical side. Now, the mental exercise and nourishment are just as important as physical and spiritual exercise and nourishment. You want to make sure that the acceleration of your mental health, mental well-being, and mental capacity keeps up with your physical capacity. So make sure at 40 that your mind has kept up with the passing of the years. Don't stay 30 at 40. Don't stay 30 at 50. Keep up the learning curve with mental exercises. I congratulate you for your investment in this cassette program as a further expansion and stimulation of your mind and your thinking. It's so important for you and me to be stretched beyond where we are. It's too easy to just comfortably sit and stop growing. It often doesn't seem to be that necessary to make the push, to make the effort to learn and to grow and to challenge yourself. But let me give you something to think about. The last few years of the 20th century are going to demand a lot more mental vigor and mental activity. The competition and complications of life are going to truly challenge the full capacity of our mentality. So, stretch your mind. It's easy when you finally find yourself in a good job to stop pursuing mental development. Have you heard about the accelerated learning curve? From birth up until the time we are about 18, our learning curve is dramatic, and our capacity to learn during this period is just staggering. We learn a tremendous amount very fast. We learn our language, our culture, our history, science, mathematics, everything. But guess when this learning curve starts to taper off? When we get our first job, usually. Now sometimes, for some people it will continue, but sure enough, here's where it usually levels off. If there are no more exams to take, if there's no demand to get out paper and pencil, why read any more books? Now you will just learn by some experience, just getting out there and by doing it wrong and doing it right and stumbling around. You learn some. But can you imagine what would happen if you kept an accelerated learning curve all the rest of your life? Can you imagine what you could learn to do, the skills you could develop, the capacities you could have? So here's what I'm asking you to do. Be that unusual person who keeps up his learning curve. Succeeding in life is not usual. It's unusual. You need to develop some unusual habits to earn the outstanding rewards. A friend of mine said, a standard education will get you standard results. You want a lot more than standard results? You need to become a lot more than a standard person. And now I've got some more good news for you. Never before in the history of the world has it been easier for someone like you or me to become educated, skilled, highly creative, innovative, and spilling over with profitable ways of thinking. I'm talking about making full use of audio cassettes like the one you're listening to now. You can turn your automobile into a professional growth seminar on wheels. I'm serious. Cassettes can turn the time you spend driving your car, dressing in the morning, or exercising into solid, effective personal development. While your friends are vegetating on the way to work, listening to the radio that doesn't help them one bit to do a better job, you're picking up new negotiating skills, better sales techniques, or a new creative way to solve problems. Keep building your library of fine, quality cassette resources. There isn't a better place you can put a few dollars every month. Become a student of good ideas, wherever they can be found. Always be on the lookout for a good idea, a business idea, a product idea, a service idea, an idea for personal improvement.
Now, since forming these new habits of personal growth will require some discipline in the beginning, let me give you a key to discipline. Discipline starts with the little ones and works up to the big ones. Start with all the things you can do to make your life better and make you feel better about yourself. Make a list. Life will give you some pretty big challenges if you can handle the small ones. But unless you practice on the small ones and master those, you don't have a chance for the major ones. A man strides out of his house to go straighten out the corporation, and he has not yet straightened out his garage. Who's kidding who? So work on all the disciplines that will improve the quality of your life. And here's an important thought. Everything affects everything else. Every lack of discipline affects every other discipline. Mistakenly, the man says, this is the only place I let down. See, that's not true. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Now, here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects every other discipline. Every new thing you try affects the rest of your performance. Isn't that exciting? So get started on every small discipline you can think of. You can't believe what it will do for your self-confidence. And remember, the greatest deterrent to success is lack of self-confidence. And lack of self-confidence comes from not doing what you could do. Next comes self-motivation. And really, it's the only kind of motivation there is. Self-motivation. I was on a lecture tour in Australia not long ago, and the press interviewed me. And they asked me, Mr. Rohn, are you one of those American motivators? I said, no, I'm a businessman. I can share my ideas and my experiences, but people have to motivate themselves. Hey, I found out you can't change people. They can change themselves, but you can't change them. Lord knows I've tried. I had a super group of salespeople back in those early days, and I said, I'm going to make them successful if it kills me. Guess what? I almost died. You can't do that. In management, we learn good people are found, not changed. If you want good people, you have to find them. That's the best answer I can give you. If you want motivated people, you have to find them, not motivate them. The first rule of management is don't send your ducks to Eagle School. Why? Because it won't work. I've tried it all. I picked up a magazine not long ago in New York, which had a full page ad in it for a hotel chain. The first line of the ad read, we do not teach our people to be nice. Now that got my attention. And the second line said, we simply hire nice people. I thought, what a clever shortcut. Motivation is a mystery. Why some people are and some are not. Why does one person in sales see his first prospect at seven in the morning and the other salesperson sees his first prospect at 11 in the morning? Why would one start at 7 and the other start at 11? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. I give a lecture to a 1,000 people. One walks out and says, I'm going to change my life. Someone else walks out with a yawn and says, I've heard all this stuff before. Why is that? Why aren't they both affected the same? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. A wealthy man says to a 1,000 people, I read this book, and it started me on the road to wealth. Guess how many people of the thousand go out and get the book? Answer, very few. Isn't that incredible? Why wouldn't everyone go get the book? It's called Mysteries of the Mind. To one person you say, you better slow down. You can't work that many hours, do that many things, go, go, go. You're going to have a heart attack and die. And to another person you say, when are you ever going to get off the couch? What is the difference? It's called mysteries of the mind. Why wouldn't everyone strive to be wealthy and happy? I don't know. It's a mystery. So be self-motivated. Don't give that job away to someone else. The guy says, boy, if someone will just come by and turn me on. Hey, what if he doesn't show up? You've got to have a better plan for your life. Since you're self-motivated 
And I would assume that you are, since you've invested your money, and now you're investing your time to gather good ideas for more success. I want to share the best of what I've learned and experienced in my life. You deserve the best I have to give, and more. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that this fundamental personal development is a major part of the platform, the foundation on which you can build. So let's get on now with the rest of the fundamentals for wealth and happiness. Of all the subjects that stir the imagination, this has to be one of the major ones. Financial independence, freedom from financial concerns, owning the financial resources that give you the means to really do what you want to do, to make your life all that you want it to be. We don't have time to go through all the interesting ideas that have been written and discussed on the subject of financial wealth, but I will offer you a few major ideas that have really made a difference in my life, financially and otherwise. Mr. Shove said to me that he thought it was a worthy goal to become financially independent for three major reasons. First, with money no longer a time-consuming consideration, I could then begin devoting heavy time to all the other dimensions of my life. Second, he suggested I become financially independent because it would tremendously increase my ability to help others. Only from positions of strength, including financial strength, can we help someone else. Finally, and most important, he said, I believe it is worthwhile to become financially independent for the sake of developing the person you must become to achieve that goal. What a major secret he taught me. Set a goal to entice you to become the person it takes to achieve it. Reaching the goal is the lesser value. The primary value lies in the person you become by reaching it. You see, it's not the million dollars that's most important. It's what you must do and become in order to be a millionaire. We're all aware that many people feel that we must be careful of focusing on money or affluence or abundance. That in it, or in the pursuit of it, there is danger. We often hear quoted from the Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I do agree. If you make money your love, and you pursue affluence to the exclusion of, or at the expense of, other values of life, you have lost, not won. However, let us consider this question. If you could do better, should you? That's not a bad question. In the time allotted to labor, in the time given to economics, care for family, success, achievement, productivity, the creation of value, the development of skills and creativity, if you could do better, should you? I think that one of the greatest satisfactions of living life to the fullest is doing the best you can with whatever you have. Doing less than your best has ways of eroding the psyche. We seem to be creatures of enterprise. Surely it is the reason for the seasons. The soil and the sun and the rain and the seed all say, what can you do with us? The seasons say, do you have the genius to make something unique of us? Life says, here's the raw material. What splendid things can you produce from all there is? So, go for high productivity, the full employment of your genius, the full development of your potential in all areas of your life, including earning money. That is the essence of life. Truly sophisticated people know it isn't the amount that counts. It's doing all that you can with all you've got that counts. With that background, let me recommend a book for you to read. The title is the Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Perhaps you've already read it. I would suggest that you read it again. It's just a small book. You can read it in one evening. I call it the appetizer for the full discourse on the subject of financial independence. Now, let me give you the major theme of the book. The major theme is that what you do with what you have is more important than what you have. What you do with what you get is more important than what you get. What we do with what we have says so much about us. It reveals our philosophy of life, our attitude, what we know and what we think, and the makeup of our character. 
It is a reflection of what is going on inside of our head and within our value system and decision-making process. It also reveals our ability to weigh and to perceive. The outer is always a reflection of the inner. It is an indication, a reading, a revealing. It speaks, it tells, it shows. Remember that key phrase I gave you earlier? Everything is symptomatic of something, and it is symptomatic of something right or something wrong. It is a wise policy not to ignore the symptoms, for they can be early signs of a poor choice of philosophy or a sign that something important is being misread, misunderstood, miscalculated. So of all places, take a look here. What you are doing with your money says something about you. Now, what you're doing may be okay. All I'm suggesting is that you take a look. Let me give you some of the details of a good financial plan as suggested by Clayson's book. First, a very broad but important statement. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Net meaning the money you have left after paying your taxes. And before we go any further, let us consider that most important part of our personal, social, and economic life. We must all in our lifetime, whether we are young or old, understand the necessity and the practice of paying taxes. We have to teach our children as soon as they have any money at all from any source that if they spend it for anything, they immediately become what we call a consumer. And all consumers of goods and services, no matter how young, have to pay taxes. In California where I live, if a child is only 10 years old and goes to the store to buy something that costs a dollar, the proprietor asks him for an extra six cents. The child may look at the price tag and say to the proprietor, but it says a dollar. What's the six cents for? And what a great time to teach the necessity for everybody to pay taxes, even at age 10. So a full explanation is due. If you're going to take six cents off a kid, you've got to tell him where it goes. After all, it is his six cents. He could well ask the proprietor, do you keep it? The proprietor, of course, would explain that it's for taxes, that he doesn't get to keep it, that he merely collects it. The next obvious questions are, who gets it? And what is it used for? And with these very intelligent questions come some very important answers. To the child, we explain, since we all have decided to live together, we call ourselves a society. And for that society to function, there are some things we cannot individually do for ourselves. We cannot each build a piece of the street. The machinery would be too expensive, and it would take too long to learn how to use it and then to do it. So we have a government, and government is people we have put to work doing those things for us as a community that we cannot do for ourselves. The streets, the sidewalks, the police, all of this must be paid for. So we have agreed to take some of the money when all of us buy something and give it to the government so that it can do things for us. This is such an important subject. Kids have to learn it. We all have to learn it. We then move up to federal taxes and all that those tax dollars are meant to do. Here's a pretty good way to explain federal taxes. I call paying taxes the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. It is so very important to feed the goose, not abuse the goose, not tear off a wing of the goose, but to feed and care for it. You might say, well, yes, but the goose eats too much. Hey, that's probably true. But remember, just about every appetite eats too much. Don't we all eat too much? Let not one appetite accuse another. If you step on the scales and you're 10 pounds heavy, you've got to say, yes, me and the government are about 10 pounds heavy. Looks like we both eat too much. Remember, every appetite must be disciplined, yours, mine, and the government's. We could all use a diet. Mr. Schoff did give me a very great service when he taught me how to be a happy taxpayer. Now, I must admit it took a while, but I did finally become a happy taxpayer. Part of it was understanding what tax dollars were for and that it is right for everyone to pay his fair share. I finally decided 
I didn't mind picking up my share of the tab for the radar. It's so necessary for our safety as a country to keep the international bullies away. Some people say, why bother with all that expensive equipment? After all, they won't come over here. Obviously, they haven't read their history books. Someone else says, I'm not picking up any part of the radar. Well, then I would suggest you go where they don't have any radar. If you are going to enjoy the benefits, then you have to pay your share. Jesus, the master teacher, gave some very clear advice one day when he said, pay Caesar first. Caesar meaning the government and taxes. Hey, that's pretty clear. Pay Caesar first. And for some unique reason, he didn't see fit to criticize Caesar. He just said, pay. I don't think we need a prophet to explain that one to us. Now, don't pay more than you should. Take advantage of the advantages and the incentives. But then when you get to the bottom line, whatever that is, pay it. And pay with happiness, knowing that you are feeding the goose that lays the golden eggs. The golden eggs of freedom, safety, protection, justice, free enterprise. A society that works, provides a market, an unprecedented opportunity. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, education for our children. This is the most powerful nation on earth, and it provides us with the greatest chance to create a unique life. Some goose, some eggs. And remember, everyone should pay. Dignity demands that we all contribute no matter how small the amount. Everyone should pay. Even the federal tax bill, in my opinion. If only a dollar a year, that's okay. Just so you can say with dignity, I pay my fair share. A classic example. An ancient Bible story says Jesus and his disciples were watching people come by and contribute to the treasury. Some came by and gave large amounts. Some gave average amounts. And some gave modest amounts. The story then continues. A little lady came along and put two pennies in the treasury. Jesus said to his disciples, look at that, the lady and the two pennies. They said, two pennies? You give us this example out of all who made a contribution? Two pennies? He said, you don't understand. She gave more than anyone else. They said, two pennies? More than anyone else? Some have given fortunes. He said, you don't understand. Her two pennies represented, I'm sure, more of what she had than the large amounts represented of what their givers had. So she gave the most. How remarkable. But let's continue the story. Sometimes what is not said or reported is also a valuable part of the story. Consider what Jesus did not do. He did not take the two pennies out of the treasury and run after the little lady and say, Here, little lady, we have observed that you are so poor and so pitiful, we're going to give you back your two pennies. We just can't let you pay. What an incredible insult that would have been. She would surely have said, aren't my two pennies good enough? They represent a great portion of what I have. Will you take away my dignity? No, that scene did not occur. And what a meaningful lesson. We learn from what did not happen as well. Let me give you the eloquence of silence. The eloquence of what was not reported, but certainly must have been true. And it reads, Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury. What an important silent statement. It's of the highest philosophy. It best explains our earthly experience. Life is conditional. Value is on the other side of price. And of first importance is the act, not the amount. Everyone must pay, even if it is only two pennies. Now, after taxes, and I said all that to get to this, learn to live on 70%. The reason it's 70 is because you're going to be doing some very special things with the 30%. So what's left, 70%, is yours to spend. Now let's talk about the all-important subject of how you allocate the 30%. 
I remember one day saying to Mr. Shof, if I had more money, I would have a better plan. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, I would suggest that if you had a better plan, you would have more money. So it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts. It's not what you allocate, it's how you allocate it. Here's the first part of the allocation process. Of the 30% you're not spending, 10% should go to charity, giving back part of what you have taken out to help those who cannot help themselves. I think that's a good percentage. Now, you can pick your own percentage. It's your life, and it's your plan. But giving your money to a church or to an institution is a good idea. More often than not, they can find the people who are in need. But whether you administer it yourself or give it to an institution to distribute, 10% should be given to charity. And by the way, the best time to teach this allocation process is when a child gets his first dollar. Take him on a visual tour. There's nothing better than visual to illustrate what you're trying to teach. Take him to where some very unfortunate people live who cannot take care of themselves. Kids have big hearts. If they see the problem, they won't have any trouble giving a dime out of every dollar. And one more thing. The time to start this is when the amounts are small. It's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar. And it's a little more difficult to give away a hundred thousand out of a million.